Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. So uh, before we get started, just uh, going to set the tone of this talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about category, which is a library for functional programming in Kotlin. Uh, I'd like to find out uh, who here uses Kotlin in their job or, OK, fair, fair enough. <laughs> Scala? <laughs> All right. Haskell or others? All right. <laughs> Nice. This is probably more appealing to people that are using a Scala and moving to Kotlin or people that are in Kotlin that are uh, wanting to do uh, functional program. So without further uh, delay, Paco and I are going to kind of guide you through some of the features and also Simon, which is here with us, is going to talk about some of the other uh, cool things that we built in Category and we thought they're useful for the Kotlin community. Cool. Hi. So hello, everyone. Um, these are a short introduction. So Raul is the CTO of 47 Degrees. You know him. He's been organizing, uh, helping with Lambda World. Uh, my name is Paco, and this is like kind of my pet project, my side project, where I do my fun time. And we also have Simon in the room, who's been come visiting us. And uh, we're going to be talking about Category, which is a project that we have been working on for several months now. So how did it come to pass that we decided to go and go fully functional on um, a language that is still going into like this early infancy on, on the adoption level. So basically we started like as an exercise to learn functional programming on Slack. We have a small community of 100 developers that talk over Slack and um, it also included people from the Scala community. So Raul joined us and um, we were having like these small discussions about like Monad, functors, all these kind of uh, functional programming concepts that we only knew on the abstract. So we wanted to find some concrete way of maybe um, re, um, refactoring a whole code base using this kind of functional pro uh, programming paradigm. And from that refactor, there came a couple of like helper libraries. And from those helper libraries, it became like a whole project. So we ended up with a whole solution for type functional programming in Kotlin. So what does this mean? This means that we have a series of projects, a series of sub-projects and modules that we're going to give um, a really high overview right now of who they, what they are, what solutions do they provide, and how, do we, how to use them, basically. So what is Category? Category is a library for type functional programming in Kotlin using the traditional type classes and data types, which means none of this is something that we have invented on about ourselves. This is not something that has come out from our minds. This is something that we, uh, we understood from parts of the Scala community, from the Haskell community. Uh, we read on papers and we just decided to brought in into, um, into Kotlin. So the most basic data types, the, the way that most people will start using this kind of type functional programming, I just seem, uh, is, is just using simple abstractions that are common to your day-to-day -day patterns. So you have used try-catch before, right? The problem with try-catch is that it doesn't necessarily um, spread to the color of the function. So you have to handle it yourself, and sometimes you don't, need, you don't have those zero cases. So you can make those kind of patterns into something that is generic enough that can be used in literally any code base. So one of those data types is, for example, try. We also have others that represent absence, like option. We also have branches in execution, which can be modeled as either. You have a left side, you have a right-hand a right side, and what you're saying is that doing your execution at some point, you're going to have to disambiguate and decide what to do for each one of the, of the branches. We also have uh, wrappers for existing, existing collections. So Kotlin provides you with a really good standard library for collections, for lists, for um, maps, arrays, and everything, everything that you need. Uh, and we decided to add our own uh, functional programming touches to them. So it contains some extra functions that are common for the rest of the data types. We also have some parts that are from uh, more advanced use of functional programming, which is based on uh, reader monad, writer monad, um, statey, you know, uh, we have evaluation, we have uh, some, of, some of other patterns that are capable of composing into larger programs in a way that you can form like a whole architecture. The um, coolest part, or one of the coolest data types, is that when you need to have a side effect, when you're trying to create an application that is capable of talking to a database, that is capable of going into network, that uh, can do these multiple operations and you can have errors, you also need to suspend those functions. You have to call those functions only when they are needed and you also need to handle all of these errors. 
So we're providing a whole effects package, and the effects package, the data types in there are created specifically for those use cases in a way that you can compose those effects and you can handle your already existing environments. And yeah, this is the a small overview of the data types. These data types are available today. They are all written. They are fully tested. We have like um, lawful versions. We have all the monads. We have all the instances. So they are ready to use. We can give you a few examples of how the syntax looks like. So what happens when you try to create one of those types? So for example, right now, we're going to see an option. And an option has a constructor that takes one parameter. And once we have the one parameter, we can use the map function, which means if the option didn't contain any value because it was absent, the map function would not be called. If the value is available, like in option one, you get a value of option two. Well, how is this useful? Because normally when you're doing things with null ability, you will have to encode the if this is available, then you do this operation. If not, you continue. All of this is already done for you. So you only have to call the map function of it. Another one is try. So instead of going with lowercase try, you can go with uppercase try. And then what you're doing is that you're executing a block of code. And that block of code is going to return a whole new data type, a whole new class that you can ask, did this operation complete correctly or did it, did it cause an exception? And if it caused an exception or it complete correctly, you can recover from it. But this is not the responsibility of you as a library owner. For example, when um, my user is sending me faulty information or, or they're, they're doing this kind of operations with the network, when we don't know how to recover ourselves, you can pass that information back into the library user. So try is one of those use cases. So as you can see here, we're going to wrap a try runtime exception of a boom, and we're going to map it to plus one. So the internal type of this try is actually an integer, but the integer is not provided. So it fails with an exception, it fails with a runtime exception, and you can inspect that afterwards. We have another one, which is left and right. Uh, we have a very simple syntax for it, which is whenever you have any type, any type T, you have an extension function left, an extension function right, that is capable of creating you an either for the left or the right in those, for those values. So in this case, we have something that is x is right of 1, y is right of 1, and x equals to y, because they are structurally the same. So Raul is going to start talking about um, some of the cooler ways that you can compose these data types together to make your execution um, have, se have a sequence and parallelism, basically. So. so for those of you that are Scala developers, uh, have you guys used CATS or Scala set? All right. So do you guys know the, what it's been called applicative builder or Cartesian builder? And that's called, I think it's a groupoidal or monoidal builder or something. It keeps changing names. But basically, here in Cateria, we have the same abstraction. And this allows us to abstract over RET when computing over independent operations. So for example, in this case, we have uh, three different values of a uh, type option. And then we can just extract from the option applicative instance and then map over those without actually losing type of information. And then for that same variation, we have like several uh, functions that kind uh, of encode all the different types of additives up until like 10 or 11. Question over there? Yeah, soon the code. Yeah, let me try. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. All right. So this is not only just for option, this is for any type of constructor. So imagine that just case you have here like three different features or three different deferred operations that are combined in, in independently, they're running, and then at some point you want to extract the final values uh, from those in a purely functional way. So you can use the applicative instance of that particular data type, then send in each one of the operations, and then a map function that will retrieve each one of the values uh, once completed. And this is generalized to all type constructors uh, which for an applicative instance is available. And those are pretty easy actually to, to create, which we're going to see in a second. So besides the applicative builder, we have uh, four comprehensions in Kotlin. And we are exploiting the coroutine system to actually implement a monadic bind uh, in this way. 
So similarly, if you're using a Scala like four, uh, you'll see you have like, you know, left arrow which binds the value that will be resulting from flat mat on the left side. And it gives you this uh, imperative style way of like operating over monads. We can do the same in, in Kotlin. Why? Because uh, coroutines allows us to declare suspension functions in which we can go do whatever work we have to do. And then once that value is available, then return it. So we can provide an imperative style uh, sequencing to operate over all monads as well. So in the same way we've done before with data types that are adhere to applicative, in this case, for all data types that are monadic, that includes features, free monads, option, tries, eaters, whatever, we can com compute in this uh, sequencing style. This is actually something that was very interesting to us because like when we uh, were trying to encode this in Kotlin, we found that Kotlin actually provided us more tools than Scala, since that is a Scala built-in uh, feature in the language. Basically, if your type has flat map, you can do that. But in Kotlin, because we have coroutines, we can do a lot more powerful stuff than just uh, flat map over the data type. For example, as you may know, option is a uh, Option is a data type that just like combines monadically like this, but you also may have monad error as other instances. For example, like try can have a monad error instance for throwable, uh, option for unit, uh, and either for any type B that you make it parametric. So in the case of uh, monads that can potentially throw error, which is the case in most cases when you deal with uh, Java code in Kotlin land because we are in a, you know, ecosystem where there is a lot of impurity and exceptions thrown back and forth. Uh, our coroutines or four comprehensions can automatically capture exceptions that are uncontrolled and then lift them automatically to the context of the monad error that is in scope on, on that binding for you. So you don't have to worry about manually, you know, try catching things around. Another thing we've been able to implement is, uh, let me, I don't know if you can see this here. We're able to implement uh, do notation or for comprehensions that are stack safe for, for monads that are not stack safe by definition. For example, if you have option or you have try and you're mapping, flat mapping, that's a problem in the JVM because we, we have eager evaluation and uh, the stack potentially can grow and wild at, to the point where you get a stack overflow error. Because we have control over the coroutine, we can do those bindings automatically for you in the context of free or a trampoline that actually reifies the computation and guarantees the stack is not gonna blow. So you can have an entire program that is completely stack and safe. And if it's defined in a monadic uh, sequence with this style, then you can make it a stack safe automatically <coughs> without any ceremony. So like in this case, we're just uh, you know, calling a stack safe test program directly from inside itself uh, a million times and it doesn't uh, blow the stack, despite being us uh, competing over the ID monad, which is a, an unsafe monad for stack safety. Cool. And I'm gonna yeah. give it to Paco now. <laughs> so for those of you that are, are used to working uh, more like mobile development, uh, we understand that in Android, uh, the imperative framework and the requirements of how the UI is composed and how the context has to be retained pretty much everywhere, uh, you need cancellation for some of these operations. So the way that how we implemented these comprehensions, we also allowed for arbitrary cancellation at any point of execution. That means that if you use the operator binding E cancelable, which is for binding exception cancelable, <coughs> you're gonna get a pair of the actual binding, the operation that you have to start yourself or the operation that is already running and a disposable, an unsafe cancellation of that operation. What does this mean? It means that if, for example, we were getting the information about a user profile and then we're getting the list of friends, but we're actually moving to a different screen or our phone you know, is going to the background or is some kind of operation that means that we have to cancel the current state, you can just go and call unsafe cancel. And what it's going to do behind the scenes, it's going to throw an uh, interrupted exception within the comprehension that is going to be captured by the external scope. So that means that the I.O. that you are listening to 
uh, it's gonna is gonna be in charge of uh, handling that exception. And most of the time, because you don't want your app to crash if you're running an operation, it's gonna be handled for you, and you're gonna be okay with it. So the other thing that we added support for is switching contexts. And what is the context in this regard? If you've been to Harry's talk earlier this morning, it was discussed that you're able to run coroutines over thousands uh, of operations um, in a way that is safe, that is not blowing up the stuff, that is not blowing up the memory, that has not created thousands of threads. How was it done? With a construct that is similar to um, RxJava's scheduler which means it's a, 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 some kind of thread pool abstraction that is capable of understanding how it has to schedule uh, all these operations without causing those, uh, those memory errors or uh, creating multiple threads. So we're giving you an abstraction that allows you to pass any single context and is able to run one block of code and wrapping it within your current monad. So if you're using IO monad and you say, I'm gonna bind in a database context and I'm gonna return a store user, the user store, which is an IO, is gonna be run actually on the database context. If after you fetch the user from the database, you actually have to toast the message saying the user was fetched correctly, the user was stored correctly, you can do it with your UI context. And all this operation is being done like in a, in a, single, in a single step. So those are the main features that we, we have added in terms of comprehensions. So now you can define code that is uh, originally asynchronous, that can run over multiple threads, that can throw exceptions, that is stack unsafe. You can run it in a stack safe way with background processing, with cancellation, and with all the goodies, in a style that feels natural to most people, which is something that looks a little bit more imperative, but you know behind the scenes is being compiled to basically a chain of flat notes. So, what happens when you want to use this kind of idea with other people's libraries? <coughs> so in our case, it's very common in a, in a stack like Android development to have something like RxJava. And RxJava defines flat map, but also happens in architectural components. Architectural components like data defines flat map. And flat map is the operation required for us to create a monad. So if we had that description, we can, we can create a thin integration layer that allows us to have this um, comprehension style being used for literally any abstraction for asynchrony that you have right now. So in this case, I'm gonna be using RxJava, and I'm gonna say I have the observable monad, which is already on the library, which is part of our code. And I'm gonna say, we're gonna be running a sync, anything, we're gonna run a piece of code that is gonna call the current milliseconds for a video player. So you're playing, you're playing like um, a video, you're gonna start second zero, and you, you have to keep track of how, how often does it update. And this is actually a blocking operation, meaning that every time you call it, it's gonna go to, it's gonna go to the video player, it's gonna get it back, and you, what you would really want is like an observable. So you can just say, you're gonna run this operation in sync, and you're gonna subscribe it on the main thread. You're gonna be asking the video player on the main thread what you want to do. You can get the initial value, and then you can say every timer, every 100 milliseconds, you're creating with an observable, you're gonna be calling the next line, which is getting the current tick, and you're gonna yield that tick. The difference between the original tick and the final tick. What this means is that with this binding operation, you have created a new observable, and this observable encodes the information of fetching the initial value of the video player reproduction and pull the state every 100 milliseconds. And you have done it not with the original style, with the style of coroutines, which feels more natural. So, with all these features, basically what we're trying to provide is a better way for everybody to, uh, to write their code. That feels that when they are migrating to this new paradigm, they are not as lost, and they're using simple binds. They're using a sync await, which feels natural from people coming from like C Sharp, coming from a JavaScript background. So this is the end of this section, and now Simon is gonna be speaking a little bit about optics, which, just go ahead. <laughs> right, so we heard a lot about optics already this session, uh, or this uh, conference, and Kotlin favors immutability, as we as functional programmers also all favor. Um, so let's see a simple example. Uh, we have a couple of uh, data structures here. Uh, product types, so an employee has a company, a company has an address, an address is a street, and we can simply create an employee by nesting the construction, right? Pretty straightforward. But 
what happens if you want to update uh, this structure, um, Kotlin offers a copy method. Uh, and basically what it does, just like in Scala, it copies the structure and it allows you to uh, update the value. But here, it's, you can see for few, four nested values, it is already extremely tedious, right? Uh, it doesn't read well, it is extremely tedious to read, uh, and it is extremely tedious to write. So optics offer solutions for this. Optics are a, a way to deal with uh, immutable data structure in an elegant way. So we can create a lens for an employee that has a focus in the company. And we can also create a lens that for a company that has a focus in an address. And we do this by creating a lens uh, for a getter and a setter. So for example, for the uh, employee, we simply say for to get the company, just get the property, right? And for the set value, you can say if you give me a new company and you give me an employee, I can copy the employee and give it the new uh, company property, right? Uh, and the cool thing about this is setters and getters don't compose, but lenses do. And now we can compose um, four lenses together and we can say uh, we modified employee and we can now use a function that works on string to capitalize the street name, right? But this is, of course, a lot of boilerplate codes, which we don't like. So you can have category do all the dirty work for you with an annotation processor or metaprogramming with use it by using the lenses annotation for a data class, all the lenses can be generated for you. So you can get rid of all this dirty boilerplate code. Um, and now we can simply compose whatever we need, reuse it wherever we need, and we can modify uh, our employee in a very straightforward and easy way. And another um, optic we already see in this conference is the prism. And we can use prism for some types. So let's imagine we have a network result, which can be a success or a failure. Um, and basically, uh, what a prism does, it is abstracts the way of pattern matching and constructing the value. So here you can see we have a get or modify. And basically, what you have to tell the prism is, uh, is it a success value? And if it is a success value, it is right. If it's not, then it's left. So now the prism knows what is the success value for this prism and what is the failure value for this prism. And with this prism, we can now um, work on a network uh, result without having to care if it is actually uh, a success or a failure. So we can now uh, lift uh, our functions uh, into this higher context of network result without having to deal with all this boilerplate code. Uh, and the cool thing is here, for example, you could uh, also compose it with another lens for network result to directly work on the content of the success value without having to deal with whatever is the actual result. But this again was also a lot of boilerplate code. And you can again have category to all uh, the heavy lifting. So with a prism annotation for a sealed class for a sum type, you can get all uh, prisms generated for you. So goodbye for the boilerplate code and we can now compose all our optics together and work with immutable data in a very elegant way. So another feature we are building is uh, we've already encoded three monads uh, in category. So you can do like similar to how you do in Scala to either use them as machinery to build architectures or just for stack safety or for whatever reason. And uh, 47 degrees is invested in the future of category as well. And one of the reasons we're working and contributing is because we are porting some of our Scala libraries such as uh, Freestyle and Fetch to, to Kotlin. So soon you'll be able to create uh, free algebras just basically annotating your interfaces with free or with tagless and then enjoy tagless final or free monad style in Kotlin as well. Yeah. So for those of you also who um, are worried about what is the size of this library, because it seems to have these many functions. We have the comprehensions, we have the data types, type classes, we also have the effects and everything else. What we like to say is that we are aiming for modularity. You don't have to take the whole library day one, put it into your application, put it into your program, in your backend, and start using all the features. 
You can just pick and choose the ones that are important to you. You can just get the basic core, and from there you can expand to the rest of them as you as you see fit, or as it started to fit uh, to fit in your flow or the current state of your of your program or application. So, right now the separation is almost in place. We have to work a little bit through um, the data and type classes and everything else, but we understand that we're also working in no, some new modules. They are not ready for production yet, but we have people taking a look into it. For example, we're looking into per, uh, persistent collections, which is a different way of representing collections in memory in a way that they are immutable, but they are also not super slow to update. We're also looking into recursion schemes, which is like some super advanced, mind-blowing stuff that you see in conferences like this, and it's really cool to implement, but it's really hard to get it right. So that's, that's the kind of project that we're trying to build. We're trying to build an ecosystem of libraries for all people to contribute to that can start for a simple core, and from there it can expand for everybody. <coughs> so we're going to be talking a little bit about how did we make this whole library work in Kotlin because many of these concepts were not necessarily part of the original language. And the first limitation, the first real limitation that we had is that there was no support for higher kinder types. What is a higher kinder type? It's a way for you to abstract over the container of a generic, not the content. You're abstracting over less collection, optional, either any other thing, rather than the content of those uh, of those data types. You're not abstracting over integer, you're not abstracting over anything else, you're abstracting over the container. And that's something that not many languages support. For those of you who come from Scala, this is a really natural thing, you can just like ignore me for this section, but for the rest of you, um, we just want to say that we take a couple of simple steps using language features that are already available right now. We didn't do anything smart with the compiler. We didn't do anything that was out of this world. We, you don't have to add any extra, anything extra to your flow. This can be done with vanilla Kotlin. So what we're doing here is we're going to be using an interface that is called a higher kind. And this interface is parameterized on an F and an A. The F is the type of the container. The A is the type of the content because you want the type of the container to not be generic on the type of the content, you need a new type that represents only a tag for this higher kind. So we're going to be calling that, for option, option high in kind. It's a type that cannot be instantiated, it's not important, you cannot get any data from it, you cannot inherit from, it just exists as a tag in the generic types for you to find that um, this current abstraction supports this specific optional. So once you have those two, you have higher kind interface, you have this um, optional type, you can define an extension function that is parameterized on that first parameter of HK of F of A of F. You're replacing the F with the tag type, and you can just say, I have an evaluation function that is going to downcast the value safely. So whenever you're defining your shield class of option, you're going to say it's an option kind. And an option kind is actually a higher kind that contains the option. And that's the only implementer in the whole system. So you can have a single evaluation, a single evidence function that is capable of safely downcasting the value. So when you're working with generic information, when you're trying to say return types for my functions are, are irrelevant to the container, you can just say return an HK of F of integer or of user of whatever thing else. And the F is going to be provided by the user who's also going to have to do the safe downcast for them to get the final information. And this sucks big time, so. <laughs> I know. But it's like a limitation of the language, and this is how we have overcome that. So instead of for you to write all this boilerplate code that you don't quite understand, you just heard it from me the first time, basically what we give you is that if you annotate any data class, any seal class with higher kind, we generate all this information from you. So if you have multiple generics, three, four types, it doesn't really matter, or just one, we are going to generate all the type aliases, the tags, and the higher kinds, and everything that you need to do, to do operations on this kind of type. And just to clarify, higher kinds are necessary to encode type classes like functor, monad, applicative, and so on. And for that reason, we have to emulate it. And that's where other Kotlin libraries uh, have stopped, and category has continued. They've stopped at the point where the language was imposing the limitation of lagging higher kinds. So let's go into uh, type classes. So, so we've also, uh, we don't have implicits in Kotlin or we don't have type class support in Kotlin and uh, we needed to emulate that as well. So 
Now we have a very dirty trick, which is uh, basically you can create polymorphic code in Kotlin like you could in Scala or Haskell. But whenever you need evidence of there being an instance of a type class of a given type, for example, in this case, we need the evidence of applicative for option, then uh, there's two ways we can do it. First way, the user is gonna have to give you that instance manually, so they have to pass it by to each function call, which is super tedious, and then you have to like keep thinking about how do I get an option applicative and how do I send it this place, right? And the other option that we have is that we exploit the fact that Kotlin support default parameter arguments, and then it supports reified generics. So we can actually look up the generic information at runtime, and then from a global registry, give you the register instances for a given data type. So it's type classes done the runtime way, which is not the right way uh, by any means, yet it works as it is uh, today with Kotlin. But we are not stopping uh, there. Let's see a couple more examples. Uh, in the case, uh, for example, if you needed, say, monad error of F and E, since you don't know what F and E are until that is concrete at some point in your application, then we can use inlining, which actually tracks all of the generic information that are passing to the method. And then once we have that generic information, we can extract the type classes instances that we need to write polymorphic uh, coding code. We still don't like this. <laughs> and this is the way you currently encode a type class. For example, this is what functor would look like if it just had like map. We're gonna ignore lift and some of the other methods, but if it had map, here's the higher kind representation of your FA, and then the higher kind representation of the return type, which would be your F of B. So implementing those are still easy. It's not a, like a pain. So if you still wanted to do like polymorphic code besides using option, try either, or the basic data types, you could do it and it, it won't be too hard. We actually have derivation built in, in category. So based on the shape of your data type and the method that it contains, we can automatically derive most of the type class instances for you automatically. So if you define something like option or something that has you know, the classical map, flap, map, and so on, they can just annotate it and then have the instances automatically register and then they derive from the data type. If you wanted to write a manual instance for whatever reason, because you don't like the way we are doing the auto derivation, you can do so as well. And if you flag it as an instance, that's basically saying this is a global implicit. So whenever needed, so whenever you require, in this case, the functor instance for either, then this one will be instantiated or like brought into your scope. And finally, we're not stopping at that. We're actually trying to change that at the language level so that we don't have to do all this like hackery and tricks to, to support type classes and kind of like the style of programming we want to do with polymorphic uh, style. So there is a keep that you guys can visit and then uh, say your opinion. And this keep actually introduces type classes uh, formally for Kotlin. <coughs> and it also uh, proposes a lightweight version of uh, higher kind of types for the language, which will look like something like this. It's not final syntax, but this is what's proposed at the moment. So you can say that an extension interface, whatever in this case functor, that represents the type class. And the reason why it uses extension is because it actually fits perfectly in the way the Kotlin ex extension system works for syntax. So you would say, I want a functor for any type constructor f, and then I can refer in higher kind position f of a. I don't have to do the h, k, f of a like we've done before. And then you can de declare actual instances that are extension objects or classes or whatever, which may have further constraint on other instances if needed. And at the point you are gonna use this in a polymorphic context, the only thing you have to say is, uh, I have this uh, polymorphic function and I need a functor of f. So similar how we do implicits in Scala where we provide implicit arguments or context bound arguments, here we'll just require that the functor of f uh, is available in the scope. So if that, that's accepted, 
these are the consequences in the changes of the language. First, we don't need to any longer call f or do the save downcast for, to go from the higher kind representation to the regular value. We will introduce in Kotlin compile time dependency injection, which will potentially uh, render useless a lot of the frameworks and tools that people in the Java and Kotlin world use for dependency injection, like Dagger, guys, and so on. And it can also allow us to do other powerful techniques like encode the code in a type safe way without using runtime reflection and many of the techniques that we use today in Scala and are given to us as a, as, as a given. We, we take them for granted, but, but really when you look how people in Kotlin are encoding the same problems, they're still using the good old school reflection over structures, uh, you know, runtime lookups and things like that, immutable state. So this will allow the compiler to verify our dependencies. It will bring type classes. We won't be tied to a inheritance on the system. What happens if they don't accept the proposal for the language? <laughs> so we have a plan B. We have an add implicit meta uh, annotation and we've looked at possibilities on how we can actually traverse the, the kinds of information and the concrete call sites and we, how we can reify that ahead of time as a compilation step and provide actually uh, implicit resolution in Kotlin that it wouldn't be as complex as the one in Scala. It would be more of like a global style but still like, you know, fit most of the use cases. What if we are not able to implement that because we have already started doing that and there's a few edge uh, cases? Then we are hoping that the Kotlin ecosystem open compiler plugins uh, for good, uh, well documented, so that we can potentially introduce type classes or this new syntax with higher kinds uh, through compiler plugins. And as a last resort, we can potentially discuss a, a compiler fork if not, but we are determined to bring in like type functional programming uh, to Kotlin. And wanted to share that with you guys, so. <laughs> if you like what you're seeing, please go here and voice your opinion and why it's important to you if you're doing Kotlin. Cool. So a little bit of thank you right now to all the inspirations and everybody that um, has helped us make this library go forward. So this came from an initial small idea and has fleshed out into a whole project, a whole idea, a whole ecosystem that we can start using today. So this is our, some of the libraries we took inspiration from. More inspiration than others, I would say. And uh, you can go visit them today. So Cats and Scala C are really well known on the Scala community. I guess pretty much everybody from Scala in the room should know about them. Uh, freestyle library from 47 degrees to make free Monad available. Uh, Monaco, which is the one related to optics. Functional, which is the current uh, library for functional programming that is being used in, um, in regular Kotlin. And Paguro, which is being done by Jim in the United States and we're looking into how to add persistent collections uh, to our ecosystem to improve performance. And this is just not like the three of us that were here talking. This is a team of a bunch of uh, people that are contributing to category, to which many of those are here. So I'll invite you to stand up and then say thank you to all of you guys for working in category. <laughs> and if you guys like what you're seeing, please join us. We are in Gitter, we are in, a, in the Kotlin Slack, and also on GitHub. And normally, if we have time, we offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring for people that are getting started, either as users or contributors. So that's all we have.